Hi, everybody. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. A very warm welcome to all of you to this uh, post-ASH brought to you by the International Academy for Clinical Hematology. Uh, I'm Mohamed Moti from the Sorbonne University and St. Antoine Hospital in France, and it is my great pleasure to moderate today uh, a very uh, popular, uh, traditionally very popular uh, webinar, roundtable discussion, dedicated to the latest uh, advances in the field of hematopoietic uh, stem cell transplantation and cellular therapy in general, but we will have a more focused cellular therapy webinar uh, later uh, in the months, I think, uh, uh, after uh, a fascinating uh, American site of hematology annual meeting. And while we all think and are very excited about all the new and fascinating new agents, Actually, believe it or not, uh, transplant is still around. It is still very useful to many patients. And actually, research, uh, clinical research, translational research, basic research around the transplant, whether it's GVHD, whether it's how to optimize conditioning regimen, is still extremely active. And this has been really highlighted during ASH because the number one abstract at the plenary session was actually a chronic GVHD abstract, and we'll talk about it. One of the later breaking abstracts actually was a transplant abstract about a new conditioning uh, regimen uh, for sickle cell disease. So you can appreciate <laughs> this is really moving uh, very uh, rapidly, very nicely. So. I personally believe that it's not about transplant versus no transplant, transplant versus drugs. The story is more about how can we combine and optimize all of the available tools to increase the survival of the patient. And in order to discuss all of these advances, I'm very honored and privileged to have with me today a uh, very highly distinguished uh, faculty, uh, namely uh, my co-chair at the ICH, Professor Arno Nagler from uh, Tel HaShomer uh, in uh, Israel. Uh, I have also uh, with us tonight uh, Professor Leo Luznik from the John Hopkins in the U.S. I have also, and there's no specific order, it's just by the appearance on the screen in front of me, uh, Professor Baggy Delaria from uh, uh, the Vanderbilt uh, uh, in Nashville, Professor Samar Al Humsi from NYU in New York, uh, Professor Florent Malar from the Sorbonne University, and last but not least, uh, Professor Olale Khan Oluwole, hopefully I'm pronouncing it correctly, from the Vanderbilt uh, Cancer Center in Nashville. So thank you all for joining us. And uh, I would say in order to start the discussion, and by the way, it's a, an interactive live broadcast. So please don't hesitate to send your questions, your comments, your suggestions, and I'll do my best to share it with the uh, panel. So in order to start the discussion, my first question, and I don't know who's gonna be the designated volunteer, is what is your overall take from ASH uh, this year? Uh, who's, who wants to start? So uh, I think that first of all, I mean, the most impre impressive, one of the initial impressive things to me was the number of participants. So, I mean, uh, I think that it was even more than the, before the Corona time or COVID-19. So really it was very active ASH and uh, very impressive and very new data. Uh, and then we have very sophisticated uh, science and also clinical work. So, you know, if we move to transplantation, on the one hand, we had the, uh, you know, predictive al predicting algorithm 
uh, you know, for prediction of uh, survival mm-hmm. and the uh, GVHD and the artificial intelligence and the uh, biomarkers, I'm sure we will speak about it. And on the other hand, we had uh, several talks from uh, Katie Ulab in, uh, in Harvard about, you know, uh, single cell sequencing of patients that received the uh, donor lymphocyte in, in, infusion and uh, minor antigen in order to predict or oh, the lab from uh, uh, Vago from Italy uh, like to dissect between uh, GVHD and GVL and try to predict you know, by whole genome sequencing and single cell and single cell in tissue, uh, you know, the GVL from GVHD and uh, and moving for a specific uh, uh, immunotherapy for a relapsing patient, which is one of the obstacles for successful transplant. So, I mean, it was at least for transplantation, and you mentioned already, you know, the the late-breaking abstract with the reduced intensity, many works on single cell disease, including from Saudi Arabia, Arabia on 200 patients with the fertility after transplant for sickle cell, and then the GVHD, new drugs, and new antibodies. It was a very exciting meeting for me. Thank you, Arnon. Actually, you're making my life very easy because you gave me the table of content. So let's start uh, in a logical manner. Let's discuss GVHD prevention. And we have here uh, two uh, guys, namely uh, Leo and Samer, who are really uh, pioneers in developing GVHD prevention. Obviously, post Psy has been uh, a superstar. So, Leo, what are your thoughts about GVHD prevention based on this ash? Do you believe that based on the communications post Psy is here to stay and it's spreading? And how can we move the field of GVHD prevention forward? You, uh, sorry, a minute ago, I had a little bit uh, technical issues. So if there is anything, please let me know. Um, I think uh, Ash have confirmed some of the very interesting data from before. I think what we are learning at least talking about the PT side, that is probably old name or somebody gave it its uh, great equalizer. So it basically everything is equilibrated. So I think that's what we are learning also from the data uh, what Arnon had, that outcomes are the same across the GVHD prophylaxis. I think we are learning more and more. So that's, I think, one thing what we are learning uh, and confirming with, with the largest data sets. I think in a field uh, by PTSI uh, and GVHD prophylaxis, I think one of the issues which still remain, um, what are the optimal pairings? And I think uh, what I'm also very excited, are we bringing the new drugs in the GVHD uh, prophylaxis field? I'm very excited about the data with the new uh, GVHD treatment, and we can talk about uh, for the chronic GVHD, but I'm very, very excited. The new drugs are coming on board, uh, and I think the PTSI, and if you look at current combinations uh, with MMF and cyclosporin, and as well with ATG, are good, but I like the new perturbation, and I'll let Samer to talk a little bit more about his favorite drug and combination. But one of the combinations that I would like to bring is that we are currently seeing that uh, JAK inhibitors are moving in the field of the GVHD prophylaxis. Uh, there was a great abstract. This was probably, um, I was very uh, excited by that abstract. It was abstract, abstract um, 356. Uh, so, sorry, it was abstract from the University of uh, Washington University from uh, which used it as as a part of GVHD prophylaxis where I have seen uh, very interesting data uh, where we are seeing that uh, this new combination can prevent as well CRS. Um, we have seen on other fields very interesting data from ORCA using the ORCA uh, platform, which is the combined high-dose conditioning with uh, new T-cell engineering. I think we have seen some interesting uh, development on that end. But uh, besides this drug, I think Samer uh, had been pioneered in bringing uh, some new drugs comparing in, pairing with PTSI in the field of GVHD prophylaxis. 
and I'll let Samer a little bit comment on his data. There was very similar abstract from University of California, San Diego, uh, using the same combination of this uh, uh, CTLF4 uh, IG compound. Samer? So this is really interesting, uh, Leo, thank you. So on one hand, it looks like, and you uh, worded it very nicely, uh, both sides well established, although we may discuss that the dose in some patient may need to be reduced, but then we're moving to combination. So uh, Florent can comment on this at some point. We have uh, the combination with ATG, which is now spreading progressively, especially in Europe. But at the same time, we have uh, combinations, as you mentioned, with JAK uh, uh, inhibitors, but also, Samer, you uh, have introduced uh, this combination with uh, anti-CTLA-4 uh, agents. So can you uh, comment on this? Sure. Um, uh, first of all, thank you very much, Mohammed. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, I'm just going to make a couple of general comments if you uh, would allow me just to be a little bit, you know, more broad, and then I'd be more than happy, you know, to focus on uh, our study with post-transplant psi, uh, abatacept, and uh, uh, tacrolimus. You know, it's it's really exciting from my point of view as somebody who's interested in GVHD prevention to attend uh, the ASH meeting this year, because what I can tell you, the impression I get out is that after years of stagnation and repetitiveness, finally, we are seeing the field moving forward. Like Leo said, we are introducing new drugs and we are starting to move away from, you know, the regimen that was with us for uh, uh, years and years. I, I think, you know, from my point of view, when I look at the data presented at ASH for GVHD prevention, I see, if you wish, two schools of thought. One school essentially um, still persists that methotrexate and tacrolimus is viable and could be resuscitated even after the BMTCTN1703 trial. And a school of thought essentially believes, like Leo said, post transplant psi is essentially the standard of KRS platform. And our efforts now should focus on optimizing that regimen, whether it's changing the schedule or the dose, or eventually finding the best combination. Of course, you know, the BMT-CTN uh, 1703 study was criticized by our counterparts in uh, Europe because the control group did not have um, um, ATG in it. And this is why I was very interested in two studies presented during ASH. Both of them were by the EBMT. Um, I think one of them was uh, by Arnon, looking at uh, comparing post-transplant site platform to uh, methotrexate calcineurin with ATG. And I think there was a study in AML and a study in MDS. And it's very comforting to notice that uh, the study on AML did not show much difference. Perhaps there was lower treatment related mortality. On the other hand, in the MDS study, actually it was in favor of post transplant psi with decreased incidence of EQGHD and ultimately uh, improved survival. So it seems at least, you know, in retrospective studies, even if you add ATG, post transplant psi uh, remains essentially uh, the winner. We spoke about, you know, uh, Leo mentioned uh, uh, JAK-2 uh, inhibitors. There was the study that was mentioned by uh, Ramzi Aboud from WashU with etacetinib, essentially to decrease the incidence of CRS or what we call haplostorm. But there was also a very interesting study from, uh, from Mass General, um, I think presented by uh, Corey Cutler, that added essentially roxalitinib um, to a combination of methotrexate and tacrolimus. That study actually is very interesting, picked up for endpoint um, the uh, uh, steroid uh, uh, treated patients with chronic GVHD. And actually, if you take this as an endpoint, the study was positive and patients that received um, essentially, um, um, sorry, I mixed up with the study. I think the study by Corey Cutler was obentizumab. We'll come to the rexalitinib. The obentizumab essentially is the study by Corey Cutler and essentially uh, gave obentizumab um, three months, six months, nine months, and 12 months after the transplant. And at this point, you know, like I said, the uh, uh, treatment with steroid for chronic GVHD incidence was lower in the treatment group, suggesting that potentially, you know, the drug has a role in preventing chronic GVHD. However, actually, if you look at the endpoint of moderate to severe chronic GVHD, there was no statistical difference, which from my point of view suggests that, especially if you look at the incidence of steroid requiring chronic GVHD at one year was 11%, 
went to 28% at two years. This to me suggests that perhaps the drug is simply delaying the incidence of chronic GHD by interfering with you know, uh, immune tolerance. Now, the study, which was actually also from Boston, was with ruxolitinib added to tacrolimus uh, methotrexate. And actually, this was a, a multicenter study presented by uh, uh, Dr. Philip uh, de Philip uh, from uh, 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 Mass General, and essentially uh, reported in a phase two study good incidence, good low incidence of acute and chronic GVHD. The problem with the study is that the study allowed droxelitinib to be administered between day 30 and 100, and essentially many patients had events before even they get on the study, so they were excluded, which tells me that this is essentially a very selected group of patients. And even if it's selected group of patients, the incidence of relapse was as high as 27%. And I always worry, you know, I'm certainly, you know, would like to see more results, I worry about adding these agents, especially given in a way in the study, I think, uh, uh, or exelitinib uh, sort of administer the drug or allow administration the drug for up to two years, although only 17% of patients remain on the drug. Essentially, what is that um, uh, 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 telling me is that it's going to be difficult to introduce agents to decrease the incidence of relapse when you are maintaining these patients on suppressive drugs for a period of two years. And that's certainly a concern to me. And I think from my point of view, we should rather focus on shortening the duration of immunosuppression than you know, getting into a year and two years. And this is why uh, I believe the CAST study that Leo mentioned, our work combining post-transplant psi and abetacept with short course of tacrolimus is important. Essentially, these patients are done with immunosuppression after 90 days. Um, we have uh, long follow-up with the study, and the numbers remain uh, of incidence in terms of incidence of GVHD uh, very low. And actually, we recently compared it to a, a control group from CIBMTR, and hopefully we'll be able to present these data uh, very soon. Uh, so, okay, Samer, just one second, because I, uh, we need to diversify the, the, the topics. So it looks clear that now uh, comparing post psi to ATG, results are either comparable or more or less uh, uh, superior or inferior based on retrospective studies, depending on the setting, depending on the type of donor. Uh, then we have the JAK inhibitors moving earlier in the course of the disease because we know they are approved. Ruxolitinib is approved in the uh, refractory setting, both acute and chronic GVHD, and we had the update as uh, so an overall survival update from the uh, REACH 3 trial will uh, come back to this with the chronic GVC. But then my question here to you, Florent, maybe you can comment on the combination of post psi and ATG, similar to, because similar to the combination on post psi plus abatacep, where you have a short duration, maybe we can achieve this with another combination, which is now gaining a lot of momentum in Europe. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Mohamed, for this question and for highlighting uh, this important topic. So uh, as my colleagues say, PTSI is now well established. This is a backbone, uh, but still we have some patients that have gross tissue disease. We need to optimize. On the other key question, this is also that some patients experience some side effects from PTCI. So there is a platform that was developed first with standard doses of PTCI with one doses of HEG, so very low doses, 2.5 milligram per kilo of uh, thymoglobulin that was really well tolerated and that translates into some very low incidence of both acute and chronic gravitational source disease. What I need to highlight also is that both in the APLO setting, but also in patients that receive uh, unrated match or mismatch donors, we don't see any cytokine only syndromes or very few or very mild st stage one cytokine only syndromes with, with addition of ATG plus post cyclophosphamide. So in addition to be effective for gravitational disease prophylaxis, it's also decrease the immediate side effect of the uh, cytokine only syndromes we see in patients that receive PTCI alone. 
The next step was to reduce the dose of PT side because we have some patients that will experience some cardiac toxicity, some uh, severe uh, hemorrhagic cystitis, and so on. And in fact, if we use lower doses of PT side combined with the low doses of ATG, you may be as effective as with the full doses with less side effect. Nevertheless, we must be very cautious when we go to the reduced doses of prostrosphane cyclophosphamide. And there was an oral abstract at the ASH this year when they tried to further reduce the dose of PT size and they go to 25 milligram per kilo for two days. So they, they divided the doses by two. And at the end, there was an expansion score in this uh, study uh, with uh, around 30 patients. And they have two uh, patients that died from grade three acute reversal. So they didn't say, no, at the end, it was uh, the, the dose was too low. And we have to step back on to evaluate an intermediate doses uh, around, it was 65 milligram per kilo total doses. Uh, this is what we are doing. This is 60 milligram per kilo total doses. So probably this is what we should aim regarding the reduced doses of transfusion cyclophosphamide. There is also Professor Luznik that presented last year or two years ago uh, some results with some reduced doses of transfusion cyclophosphamide that was very effective, and uh, that is probably the future. Now we we'll need to see. This is for every patient or only for older patients or patients with some risk factors. I don't know yet, but I really expect that the one or two in the one or two years will have the definitive answers. So it's just fascinating because actually in the literature, Leo and his colleagues in the late 2000, 2008, 2010, and even before, they have tested the 50 milligram per kilo. And it was shown at this time, and please correct me later if I'm wrong, it led to severe chronic GVHD, actually, uh, such a low dose. It, it, it was actually one dose. Um, they did oh. test, they test lower dose back in, uh, in the 70s. But and the lower dose, uh, uh, we have never tried. We, we tried 50 when the original haplo. And it was not working. So, so we have never tried a lower dose. We'd rather try to have lower cumulative dose. Uh, but there are trials now doing it. And as you know, there is Japanese trial and as well your guys from a trial from, a, from, a, from Marseille and Paris group with 40 milligrams uh, twice a day. So this is, it looks like it's a rapidly moving target. So Baggy, what is your current practice for GVC prevention at Vanderbilt? Yeah, so uh, a conflict of interest. I was a PI on the Jack and Fee prevention study and the Orca study. So uh, all the patients we treated on this uh, Jack and Fee primary prevention study actually did extremely well. Uh, and the most common reason of dose introduction was uh, cytopenia. And uh, in few patients, we had relapses. So, uh, so we're I was, talking about actually, Rux 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 yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, Rux, Rux PT. The name is different in Europe, so. actually. There is a slight difference in the name, in the brand name uh, in Europe. So, um, so uh, it looks like, I think there is a progress for uh, being designed and should be activated this year, uh, which is phase three study uh, comparing Jack FE, which is now will be given for one year uh, instead of for two years, uh, with the TAC methotrexate versus PT side TAC MMF. Um, and it will be uh, GRFS as a primary endpoint. So it will be an interesting study to see if the uh, Jacafi based combination will uh, have the fare because the study is designed uh, to be uh, powered for superiority uh, of the investigational arm. So it will be good to know. Now, in terms of uh, our practice at uh, our center at Vanderbilt, we uh, have been ATG based centers for as far as I know. Uh, and uh, thanks to Dr. Savani and uh, Dr. Jitesha and other. Uh, senior members of our group, we have always used low-dose ATG uh, in our um, myeloablative and unrelated donor transplants. And use of PTSI is still limited to partially HLA-matched uh, allogenic transplants. So all mismatched MUDs and haplos gets uh, the standard dose PTSI with TAC MMF. Uh, and the ATG we use with PTSI only for sickle cell patients. So uh, like Dr. Kasim presented the data, we also have standard of care sickle adult uh, transplant protocol where we use combined low dose ATG with PTSI and, and TBI for our sickle patients. Apart from uh, that specific scenario, we are still using the, the low dose ATG with TAC uh, MMF or TAC methotrexate. Excellent. 
Ola, any last word on this topic? I echo what my uh, predecessor said, that um, with lower dose of ATG, we do have um, very low rates, and um, I will just continue to follow the data. Excellent. Okay, so that, uh, Leo, please. Now you need to activate your mic. Sorry, I just wanted to make one, 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 one little comment that absolutely we need to follow, but we also need to innovate. So it's always good to see we have things what we do, and then we have the things what we innovate. And, and I would just give everybody a buzz reason why we need to innovate, because we deal with CRSs, we deal with CRSs with all our effective therapies. There are more patients on the floor currently need to modulate CRS. I think we all know that the, the next five years will be integration of the transplant with uh, cell-based therapies and bringing more new studies with JAK inhibitor and new drugs will allow us rather to complement this work. But in the regard of the biology, and I'll stop right there, it's, it's worthwhile just to highlight one abstract. I would suggest everybody to read. It's abstract 475, which is basically the paper by Leslie Keane, which basically complete, compared immune reconstitution after PT PTSI versus, versus methotrexate, the New England paper. So whoever is interested a little bit more on the biology, I would really highlight them to read that abstract 475, a lot of uh, um, uh, uh, controversies with this, but I think this is a good biological read for everybody. Thank you, Leo. Buggy, you raised your hand. Yeah, I, I, I have just a question for Dr. Uh, Professor Luznik here. Uh, uh, we, I was very happy to see the ORCA T data. Of course, uh, they have this fancy way of doing T cell depletion and the risk of GVHD was quite low. NRM was go, uh, good with myeloblative conditioning and relapse were quite acceptable. Uh, but how do you see this being play out in practice? Because we have always known that whenever you put graph manipulations, uh, it's very hard to replicate at a smaller centers and, and a multi center, and especially in uh, centers with lower resources, uh, where PTSI is just so easy to do. Just a comment. Thank you. Me. Yeah, thank you. I, I think we know from pioneering study from Perugia group, when you combine myeloblastic conditioning with this type of the cell therapy, you can have excellent outcomes. I agree with your comments, but we always need to innovate. Like I said, we always have innovation and we have the things what we do. And we need to follow the trail and see innovation. And then whatever turns out to be better. But um, th that's how I see it. It's very early. It's very fascinating biologically. It will be difficult from, uh, from other issues. But uh, I'm all for it. It's new things. And we need to learn about it. That's how I would put it. Excellent. So uh, the ORCA uh, T technology is something uh, that needs to be followed. I think the phase three uh, trial is on its way. So we're looking forward to the summer. Um, uh, yeah, Arnon, sorry. I, I want to jump in related to GBHD, but move a bit. There was an abstract, abstract that I was a 0236 from Seattle that look on a patient with unrelated transplant based on the publicly available CFDR data. And they showed that the results with MMF in patients that were CMV positive was worse than methotrexate in AML and not in ALL. And they claim that this is, has to do with the NK activity against CMV and knocked out by MMF. And they speculate that maybe the, the, it will be a different story with PTCY. So I think this is now one thing. And the other thing I think is the relapses that also go with the UVHD and immune suppression. And uh, you know, I had the presentation showing no higher relapse with PTCY. It was oral presentation. So maybe we can, you know, move to the relapses and the CMV, you know, together with the GBHD prophylaxis, because most probably one of the aspects with PTCY would be, you know, CMV infection, and of course, uh, with ATG and uh, as Malard say, no higher relapse, but we increase the immunosuppression, so it's not just the GBHD, we have also the story 
Israel Labs in Transpa. Samer? Um, sure. Thank you, Arnold, for bringing this, uh, because um, in our CAST study, we had a very low rate of relapse, and we are trying to understand now doing some correlative studies, why is that? And one of the things that actually uh, was brought after the ASH meeting, what Arnon said, is that patients receiving MMF, if they are CMV positive, they have higher risk of relapse, and CAS does not have MMF. So is that also you know, playing a part? It's not clear at this point. But I think it's very important. The only thing that I wanted you know, to highlight is that we should remember when we are doing post-transplant SI, trying to optimize the schedule and reduce the dose, that all the data by Leo and his group and by Chris Kanakri and that group is essentially on bone marrow. And we need to be very careful when extrapolate this and try to decrease the dose when we are doing preferred blood, like most of us. And really, we need to be very careful and not do that unless we are doing it in well-thought randomized studies until we get really you know, evidence that we can safely decrease the dose. Thank you, Samer, for this wise uh, advice. So let me move the discussion a little bit uh, further now about treatment of GVHD. And we have treatment of acute and treatment of chronic. So, Florent, what's new when it comes to uh, acute uh, uh, GVHD? Obviously, the plenary was about chronic, but let's speak about acute now. So, yes, uh, thank you, Mohamed, for this question. So, of course, as you say, the, the plenary was about uh, chronic reversus disease. And in fact, in the field of acute gravasusos disease, we have uh, less novelty uh, because now we have these new standard second line treatment with the use of ruxolitinib. This is based on the rich two uh, clinical studies that have been published, and this is now the standard of care uh, in most uh, countries. Nevertheless, we still have some patients that fail uh, steroids, but also ruxolitinib, and we need some new third line treatments. And uh, we had the opportunity to uh, present some very uh, interesting uh, data regarding the use of a uh, fecal macrobiota transplantation, uh, a product called uh, MATCH-13 for the treatment of steroid refractory acute gravasusos disease uh, for a patient that were treated within an early access programs in Europe. And in fact, so far now, uh, we have some data from more than 100 patients, 111 patients that were treated uh, and uh, in this very high risk population that was in uh, uh, refractory both to a steroid, but also ruxolitinib on additional line of treatment, since the patient received a median of three line of treatment, the uh, overall response rate was 53%, including a majority of patients in complete response. Uh, most uh, importantly, were also able to analyze the subgroup of patients that uh, receives uh, the MAT-13, so the transplant product at the third line of treatment after they fail uh, steroids and ruxolitinib. So where, this is where we really have an unmet need to improve patient's outcome. And in this, uh, uh, in this 38 patients, so we have a 61% overall response rate at day 28 for the GI acute versus host disease, including almost all patients that were in complete response since 58% of patients were in complete response. And those patients have a survival of 81% at six months of 12 months. So uh, this is very encouraging uh, news uh, to now uh, see if we can establish uh, the uh, FMT as a new uh, standard treatment for patients that face steroid and ruxolitinib. So can I ask you, uh, I don't know, at Vanderbilt, Baggy or Ola, what is your uh, treatment algorithm? How, how do you uh, handle steroid refractory acute GBHD? And whether the so, ASH has been practice changing for you? So we are uh, quite a pro uh, ruxolitinib center. Uh, we never use two milligrams per kilogram uh, in uh, our acute GVHD patients. So we tend to start more along the line of 0.5 to one milligrams per kilogram of prednisone and actually add the low dose JAKFE within 24 to 48 hours. And uh, most of our patients starts at only at five milligram twice a day, which is actually quite decent response and good success rate of weaning them off the high dose steroid. So that has been our practice for the last two and a half, three years almost. Uh, we were part of the REACH 2 and REACH 3 studies. Uh, and uh, I have seen my colleagues also using JAKFE 
earlier and earlier, even before they meet the standard quote unquote definition of steroid refractory acute graft versus host disease. Now, among the patients who had not responded to steroid and the JAKFE, uh, really there is no standard right now at our center. Most of the patients do end up re receiving ECP, the, the phototherapy, in addition to ongoing immunosuppression. We have used the uh, alpha one trypsin off-label for severe acute graft versus host disease, as well as high-dose beta-HCG uh, based on the Minnesota data. Uh, and I, I think one or two patients we have, we have used that with some successes. But uh, really, it's a, it's a wild west uh, when it comes to post jacophy acute graft versus host disease. We don't have access to the fecal microverta uh, therapy as a standard of care at our center at this point. Any comments, uh, Leo? Uh, I'll, 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 I, I think Baggy said it pretty much uh, what we all are doing. I think we try to enroll in any BMT, CTN clinical trials. I think there is a, some interest, um, um, certainly maybe more at the corporate level. I don't know how our individual trials in combining maybe JAK inhibitor and ROC inhibitors. I think these are interesting trials. I'm very, very uh, intrigued uh, by Florent data. This is the trial, if I'm correct, Florent is available only to Europe. Uh, the field of bio, microbiota in the gut, it's, it's, it's huge. There is so much research going on in this field. Uh, there are multiple clinical trials going on in the U.S. It's usually, you know, single institutions. Uh, they're usually very complex manipulation. Uh, what I really like uh, from the concept of what uh, you guys have been doing in Paris, then it's a little bit more user-friendly and uh, might be good because I, I can't say that, that I'm so deep in the field of uh, a current available uh, uh, currently available microbiota manipulations. Um, uh, so, so Florent uh, might be good that you summarize them. Which do you think, uh, and this would be good for everybody else, which are like few forerunners trials for the uh, FMT currently going on? Because in a part we all hear there are certain trials, single institution, when you give the drug, you can get more for formal infection. So there are Certainly going to be differences with preparations are being used. And I think your preparation is very, very much more user-friendly. So, so how would you summarize which are the competing trials in this field from your perspective where you are definitely much more engaged than all of us? So, yes, thank you for, for this question, Leo. In fact, we have several approaches ongoing. Uh, there was the one that was uh, presented uh, at uh, the uh, EBMT last year when they used some third party donors on in this fact, they treat some first line treatment combined with steroids. It was very effective, but at the end, they have to stop the clinical trial because of the difficulty to access to the third party donors. And it was some single donors from a single patient. So it was very promising, but it raised some important difficulties uh, to have this kind of, uh, of uh, single donors, uh, single center study. So we need to find a way uh, to have more easily some donors. So there is two competitors so far uh, to use some whole microbiome. This is a whole FMT product, either from a single donor or for a pool of donors, but we need some bank and from readily available FMT product. And this is what we are currently doing in, in Europe with two clinical trials ongoing. One uh, for the treatment of acute reverse so disease, but we just started in Europe a prophylactic clinical trials with the same drugs, but this is not designed as an enema, but as a capsule that is uh, taken by patient at home because it's uh, we don't need to keep it in the fridge or anything. Uh, so, uh, and we'll try to restore the microbiome before and after allogenic stem cell transplantation. So uh, this is one of the, the, the most important ongoing clinical trials. What is also currently evaluated uh, in the US, and this is in part the product uh, developed by Ceres, and you may have seen that for the first time a product 
from Ceres have been approved from the FDA, a, a microbiome-based product that's been approved by the FDA in Clostridia's difficile. So it seems to be very promising the microbiome on when they are uh, going to evaluate a consortium of selected bacteria. Nevertheless, what we don't know if it will be enough because in our patients with Graver Susso disease, we have very important dysbiosis. The patients have almost no microbiome left. So just give 10 or 20 bacteria will be enough, we don't know. Uh, or maybe we need to give a rural microbiome as we are doing. So we, I think this is uh, the best way to do it. But so far, I don't have any definitive answer. And I think in the next two years, we'll know uh, where's, where the field is really moving on. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, uh, Ola, what do you think uh, uh, is the most promising approach for the future for the treatment of uh, acute GVHD? And are we going to be able to get rid of the high dose steroids and all of its side effects? Um, I think in the near future, probably not. Um, I think we will they will still have a role in the acute. I think we're going to actually get better with our treatment. We'll find the appropriate dose for the preventative. And if you can prevent it, then you don't have to treat it. Now, but for those that do have it, it's always like knee-jerk reflex. We know steroids tend to work a little bit, taking the edge off. But I think starting other therapies early would also be the way to, in other words, better prevention and then accurate early intervention to prevent higher grades. So the old dogma is better prevent than cure. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts before we move uh, to chronic GVHD? Okay, so I, chronic, yes. I, I think for acute, maybe as well as we get into chronic, that might be disease specific because I would kind of guess that this microbiota might not work for skin GVHD. So it might be what we see in the future, therapies in a trial focus on specific presentation. So I would presume FMT would be mostly for gut GVHD rather than for skin GVHD. So that's the things how I also see the trials moving on in the future. Just my two cents. One thing for sure is definitely that we need a webinar focused exclusively on microbiota manipulation because it seems to be very exciting. So chronic GVHD, for many years, actually the only treatment we had was steroids. And then uh, we had the approval of ibrutinib also, it's not uh, widely used, in my opinion, at least what I hear from colleagues, but definitely uh, brutinib as a BTK inhibitor uh, was approved. Then we had the approval of uh, also ruxolitinib in those first-line uh, steroid refractory, so after failure of steroids. And more recently, we had uh, belumosidil. Uh, which is approved by FDA after two lines of uh, therapies. And obviously, uh, on one hand, we have JAK2 inhibition. On the other hand, it's a uh, ROC inhibition. But interestingly, and it was a very nice surprise for me at ASH, we saw the data, uh, abstract number one, uh, at the plenary session presented by Dr. Dan Wolf. Uh, whom we congratulate, of course, warmly, about uh, axatilimab, which is an anti-CSF1 receptor monoclonal antibody, uh, which is thought to control the survival and the function of monocytes and macrophage. So maybe, Arnon, you would like to comment and give us your feeling about this uh, uh, beautiful study? Uh, thank you, Mohammed. So uh, it was the plenary session, and uh, in this session, they uh, was a phase three study, and they compare. Uh, so first of all, I wanted just to say that uh, you know, besides the T cells, there are other cells that are involved in GBHD, as we know, and this is one example: the monocyte. So this is the uh, old CSF one, but we also men uh, you mentioned in this. Uh, Already summer mentioned the B cell depletion by Coris that was about it, about obinotuzumab, and then the Zacharia de Philip Rituximab for bronchiolitis obliterans. 
so we need to, and this go to the Brutonim, so we need to think that there are other cells that are playing part in GBH besides the T cells. But for the axitilimab, I mean, they compare the three, to, uh, three different doses, and in 241 patients, uh, the patient were, uh, after uh, four lines of previous therapy, and uh, 74% of them received roxolitimib already, and the overall response rate was uh, 70%, and this was for a uh, 0.3 milligram per kilogram, either uh, Q1 uh, per week or Q2 weeks. So, uh, I mean, I think that this is uh, these are uh, impressive data, especially as 70% of this patient uh, you know, receive roxolitimib already up front and four lines of therapy. So for, uh, yeah. So this is um, amazing because for 40 years we didn't have any new drug and suddenly in around five years we have so many drugs. So Samer, assuming uh, all of these drugs are available to you, which I guess uh, is the case, ruxolitinib, bulimozidil, and hopefully at some point axatilimab, how are we going to sequence or to choose uh, these uh, drugs? Thank you, Mohammed. Um, I think in the paper uh, presented at the plenary session, um, it was a uh, very impressive response rate. Although, you know, it was important to know that most of these responses were partial. Um, you know, these are heavily treated patients, like Ernan said, and I'm not surprised that there are no complete responses. But what this is telling me is that, you know, it'd be very interesting to see this kind of agents early in the game. Because if you are achieving, you know, high response rate, all these responses are partial and fourth line of therapy, I'm sure, you know, it's time to think of moving it up front. The other thing to me, and, you know, uh, Leo spoke about innovation, it's, uh, you know, a problem to me that we treat chronic GVHD, steroids, you fail steroids, you try a drug, you fail a drug, you try the next one, and so on. It's really time to start thinking of combinations and maybe start identifying certain subgroup of patients that respond better to one agent as opposed to the other. Um, the ECP, you know, being old fashioned, uh, we need to figure out its place uh, with all these drugs. And actually it's an ideal treatment to combine with other agents. So when I talk about instead of just waiting until failure of an agent to add the other one, we should start thinking of combining these modalities of treatment. And actually it's not uncommon in our practice in severe chronic GVHD to start ECP with one of these agents um, as a first line, as opposed, you know, to wait until you fail, you know, a line and two and three lines. And I think this is what we need to think of doing moving forward. So Professor here, maybe, Monty, if I, oh, yeah, oh. here, uh, exactly. Baggy, I want to direct one question for you because you're an advocate of bringing ruxolitinib earlier. So these patients will receive ruxolitinib for uh, whatever GVHD prevention. And then assuming a time of steroid refractory acute GVHD, Florent will give them microbiotherapy. So what's how, how are you going to handle chronic GVHD? No, it's certainly, uh, it's become a quite a challenging situation if, if you sequence like that. And again, we will need prospective studies to, to show which exactly uh, the sequence is the best. I think the current uh, I, I don't believe uh, you will have prospective studies that will uh, demonstrate the sequence. This is a wishful yes. thought, but in my humble opinion. I can tell you uh, my uh, take on the exatilimab because we, uh, my colleague, Dr. Pitko, was the last author on that abstract. So we actually enrolled a bunch of patients on Agave study on from the adult transplant side. And this agent works quite quickly in a, in a, in a, in a, in a majority of the patients with post rux chronic GVHD. In practice, I see the problem being the logistics of it because this is an intravenous drug. Uh, many of my patients have to come every two weeks to get an infusion of this drug, and uh, it would many patients won't accept it. Uh, they are used to just take a pill a day and see me every three to four months. And convincing them to even come once a month for ECP has been a challenge. So uh, having an intravenous drug for a chronic GVHD in practice, even if it works well, uh, may not be as uh, widely used, in my opinion, if there is an equivalently effective oral drug option available. Um, so in practice, I still see 
uh, Jacafi and uh, Resurock being used before uh, Excitalimab uh, uh, being introduced, unless we see that using this drug earlier in combination with Jack or Resurock, which those studies are being planned, um, has 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 higher oral response rate, maybe some complete response rate. Excellent, Arnon. Yes. Just to go to what Summer say, I mean, there were three for me very interesting abstract about prediction of chronic ZBHD and uh, and prevention. And so one was from uh, CIBMTR by machine learning abstract 479, in which they look on uh, seven plasma proteins and, and nine pretransplant in a factor in 936 patients and can predict, you know, a chronic GVHD. And the other was a 2196 on artificial intelligence in which they predict chronic GVHD and then the magic and they can even predict the day 14. So I think that, you know, when we are going to, uh, you know, if we will know to predict it, we can start, uh, you know, the treatment earlier and maybe the best drug uh, as the uh, summer alluded uh, up front. So I, I think that there is way now to, to not just to wait when the patient will have the symptoms, but we, we may be able to predict. I don't know. I was excited about the, the, this abstract in many, many patients. Excellent. I personally feel Leo. that with the cast and the PT side, chronic GVHD will stop being a problem in the future. No, definitely the numbers are decreasing, but obviously uh, we're still struggling with around 15% of these patients. And this is really impacting the quality of life of the patient. And for me, when it comes, even if it is only 1%, it is important because... Absolutely. You, Leo... Yes, I, I think you touched that point, but I would only bring one other point. We have free drugs. 20 years ago, when I started the field, this was an orphan field. And I think we need to say this is real success based on the basic biology. If you, some of you were last year on a, on a, on a, on a, a E. Donald Thomas lecture when the Bruce Blazer talk, this was, all these three drugs were both from a mice. So what we need to say, the power to the science. Um, so I think we are very excited that this is coming from science and that we have chronic GVHD. In this regard, I think that we are seeing the paradigm shifts in the chronic GVHD. We have much less, but as Mohammed said, even a few percentages too much. So we really need to see, and this is also a challenge for Andron, and I know he's trying on our end, what is the current status of the chronic GVHD and how do we intervene? because with these new drugs to GVHD prevention field is changing. So this will be my two points, and I'm very excited about these new available drugs. Of course, we have the lung GVHD, which is unsolved problem. Absolutely. Exactly. I think that one Absolutely. remains untouched. Also, to be, works. to be fair, uh, bilumosidol appears to be quite effective in the lung. This is a drug where you can see the best responses, oh. but I agree with you. It's a terrible uh, unmet need. Yeah, yeah, and if I can add, all these drugs are evaluated in second, third like treatment, and maybe if we remove these drugs, for example, belumosidil or these new drugs, anti-CF1 uh, monoclonal antibodies in the first line, maybe we'll have some better results in particular in the lung before the fibrosis is established and is too late. So really expect to, to see the, the field moving on and to have these drugs as a first line treatment and to reduce the dose of steroids. Leo, you were mentioning the biology. Is there any room for combining these different signaling pathways and uh, mechanism of action? Yes, there are actually definitely way because if you get a jack and rock, you might finish the preventing inflammation. Um, this might be specifically relevant as we move what we are learning. A lot of these inflammatory pathways are already activated in older patients because of the aging. So what's happening with the patients who have a underlying chip who are pre-inflamed by itself? So I think there are so many things. Very interesting thing, CSF1R, it's one of the mostly expressed markers also on leukemia. So we might be hitting chronic GVHD and leukemia. So I think we are opening whole another Pandora boxes, but we need specific questions. We need to focus on specific chronic GVHD substance. So I think we are getting to the whole another game in the next 10 years, I think. 
Wonderful, And sir. The, Last, the yes. Rock, the rock inhibitor also work on fibrosis on scleroderma, so it's another uh, biology aspect. Super. And the thing so, I like the most about this targeted agent, Professor Moti, both the rock inhibition CSF1 is minimal infection risk, actually. If you look at the, the, the side effect profile, which is very unique compared to steroid and abrutinib, uh, and that makes it me very comfortable combining these two drugs because they have non-overlapping toxicity. And actually, what's interesting, just to add on uh, this, uh, Baggy, that in the agave trial, uh, the exotilimab trial, actually, it was the minimal uh, dosage that proved to be working very well. So maybe we should look to the minimal effective dose rather than the maximum yeah. tolerated dose. But that's another story. One last question about chronic UV to you, Ola, uh, uh, because it, it will allow us to wrap it a little bit. What is the treatment algorithm now we should uh, uh, apply uh, when it comes to management of chronic GVHD and when to consider the disease refractory and switch gears? Right. I think the first thing would be to not wait until too late. I think somebody just mentioned recently that once the fibrosis in the lung is established, goose is cooked. So I think re-evaluating, let's say somebody starts having chronic GVHD, you start them on steroids. We don't use that much. I think Dr. Delay already mentioned that. Within four to five days, you should ease in the next line of therapy immediately and um, see whether you can really get them off of steroids, um, roxolitinib if they have not been used before, and um, ECP, whatever else you want to do to get the treatment in early. Now, how to sequence it would also depend on what drugs are available. Some are waiting for FDA approval, So, and then there are also insurance concerns. Some will be quite expensive, at least. That is our payer market right here. So, but steroids are... They are kind of cheap. You can always start that. ECP, at least people, the patients get it, that this is a crisis mode. So they will make themselves available. But then as time goes on, they get tired. Doctor gets tired. Schedule gets difficult. But I think um, belumosidil, axatilinib, once they are available, we really should try to put them on board as quickly as possible once we see G chronic GVHD. Again, Uh, a lot of wisdom in what you said. Thank you very much, Ola. So now I'm going to open the chapter of conditioning. And I think uh, uh, in the last five or six years or so, we thought conditioning is a little bit stagnating. And after lots of excitement and enthusiasm about testing doses of uh, busulfan, adding uh, this or this, maybe uh, switching busulfan to triosulfan. But at the end of the day, since we are transplanting more and more refractory and highly advanced leukemias, uh, it doesn't look like that the conditioning by itself is going to make a big difference if you have a secondary AML with TP53 mutation and uh, 10 lines of a complex karyotype. Uh, but still, In the late breaking abstract, we saw actually a uh, 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 sort of a very effective conditioning in sickle cell disease. So my first question to you, Arnon, is give us an overview about the current status of conditioning regimens, because you, you, you've worked uh, a lot on this. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Mohammed. I was also impressed of the things that uh, some of the new things that I, uh, you know, that were combined with conditioning. So, of course, we have the myeloblative, we have the reduced intensity, and uh, we have the TBF. Uh, we have uh, several, again, comparison between busulfex and uh, TREO, one from, uh, for MDS, uh, for the chronic malignancy working party, and one in, uh, in children. Uh, and we, we present some work from the acute leukemia, several work of Alexandros from the acute leukemia working party. But uh, I was impressed by, uh, you know, some innovation that, first of all, there was a paper for MD Anderson, not for leukemia, but for lymphatic malignancies, lymphoma, that expressed CD, CD22, in which he, uh, he introduced the inotuzumab in the conditioning, and we all afraid from inotuzumab. 
um, you know, VOD, but it was very successful with the two-year transplant-related mortality of 12%, and this is abstract 233. And there was an interesting uh, paper from uh, China in which they gave for patients that have uh, MRD 10% uh, pre-transplant, they have a short course of blinatumumab of five uh, to 10 days, and then they uh, uh, went directly uh, to transplantation with a uh, with, uh, very good result. All the patients become MRD negative. Uh, 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 this was abstract 0234. And then we have also two, uh, you know, non-malignant uh, uh, diseases, which is interesting. So one was from Franco Lucatelli with Emma Palumab, which is the interferon neutralizing agent. And this for, was from, uh, for patient with the uh, immune-mediated graft failure. And then an abstract from, from Stanford in the, uh, with anti-CD117, Briquilimab. So I think that, and then there was a, a, another study from China in which they used the CAR T cells you know, as conditioning for a transplant with TLL with CD7. So beside the traditional uh, conditioning that we are still working to define them and what is the right dose, I think that the monoclonal antibody and more targeted therapy are getting in, uh, in uh, you know, some of the conditioning and, uh, you know, this is interesting for me. Very interesting, Arnold. So it's it looks like very promising that now we're moving away from the conventional chemotherapies uh, in the conditioning to combine them with these so-called targeted therapies and maybe at some point get rid of the conventional chemotherapy. Who knows? And of course, the netoclax, you know, for AML that in, 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 by Harvard incorporated into the conditioning, but also into the demand and other. So, Samer, do you think that the studies mentioned by Arnon and the use of targeted agents as part of the conditioning where on one hand you would allow engraftment and on the other hand you try actually to eradicate minimal residual disease or at least to hit the disease, uh, is this something, a venue uh, you're excited about and you feel? Because all of these webinars are recorded, guys, so we can look back into them, you know, in five years and say, who got it right, who got it wrong? Um, certainly, Mohammed. Um, and I think whether we are trying to decrease toxicity, avoid TBI, I think there was a paper uh, for Fancone anemia using um, uh, one of these monoclonal antibodies. I think this is important or eventually decrease the risk of relapse, like Arnon mentioned, you know, in a few of these papers. I think we're still a long way uh, to figure out exactly how to combine these agents and how to use them. But certainly it's it's exciting and it's a uh, work in progress. Uh, Baggy, so let's uh, go to uh, the study that was led and presented at the late breaking abstract by uh, your colleague and our friend uh, Aditala Kasim, Dr. Aditala Kasim. Uh, and he targeted something which I think now coming really, and uh, I think we are, all of us are quite happy that now this is coming into the podium, the issue of sickle cell disease. Because the good news from ASH was that gene therapy was approved during ASH, and this is great news. But I think this was mentioned at some point and by different colleagues that uh, this is not... Uh, probably something that will be applied and used worldwide. And most of the sickle cell disease cases are actually in low and middle income countries where transplant could be cost effective, especially that this is not a malignant disease. So you can still achieve like, if you're able to get these patients to transplant, roughly 90% over survival. So can you please comment on this study and Ola, maybe also Leo, all of you guys. Yeah, no, thank you, Professor Monti, for uh, giving a shout out to my colleague and my immediate boss, Dr. Adetola Kasim. Uh, so, oh, this big was conflict of interest. So, who will say only good Big conflict of interest, yes. Um, so, this was a BMTCTN 1507, a late breaking abstract on adult uh, 
uh, with a severe sickle cell anemia uh, who under, underwent a reduced intensity peripheral blood, uh, sorry, bone marrow uh, graft uh, from a haploidentical, um, most cases, the sibling donor. And uh, the study uses this novel conditioning regimen where they received two months of preconditioning uh, hydroxyurea followed by uh, ATG, uh, thiotepa, uh, fludarabine, cytoxin, and TBI, followed by post-transplant cyclophosphamide, serolimus, and MMF-based GUHD prophylaxis. Uh, and the study showed uh, quite impressive uh, low normal relapse mortality, uh, and the two-year event-free survival was 88%. Major of the patients uh, maintained their graft function and were cured from their sickle cell disease, and hence free of all the um, morbidity associated with uh, sickle cell disease. And I have personally was, have been fortunate to take care of many of these adult uh, patients who are part of the clinical trial at our center. And you see these patients in their late 30s, they have no jobs because they are in the emergency room every other week with pain crisis. Uh, they're dealing with painful ulcers from hydroxyurea. They are on oxygen. They have chronic iron overload and getting the chelation therapy, so much burden. Uh, and the life is completely occupied by this nasty disease. And then you see them six months, a year after an haplotransplant, and they're, they're living normal life, enrolling into college, getting married, having children, even some of them who we transplanted, actually some of the young adults were transplanted in their 20s. Uh, and they completely kind of turn around by just doing a transplant, very little graft versus host disease. So uh, at the end of uh, the presentation, Dr. Kasim did uh, put a table comparing the gene therapy and the haplotransplant for uh, sickle cell disease treatment and showed the pros and cons of each therapy. And like you mentioned earlier, uh, majority of the patients with sickle cell disease are in sub-Saharan Africa with no access to a million dollar plus gene therapy where uh, a haplograft can be easily done uh, in, in quite cheap way. Uh, it's actually a lot cheaper in, in, in Asia and Africa than in US and Europe, of course. Uh, and the other main uh, issue which now we are learning about is the secondary malignancies. As uh, we know that uh, all the gene therapies are using autologous stem cells. And these are chronically overstimulated in inflamed microenvironment. And they are receiving the U-sulfide-based conditioning before gene therapy. And we are seeing the late second malignancy with MDS and AML as these adults live a long time. Uh, which you solve this problem by giving them fresh, healthy stem cell from a donor. Um, so um, again, we we are also we are in onboarding for gene therapy for sickle cell disease at our center. So of course uh, we will be using it in appropriate patients uh, when uh, indication meets. But um, I think the haplotransplant and especially the PT side based thiotypa based conditioning with uh, uh, low dose ATG combination is a it's a way to go with a very little graft rejection and GVHD. So thank you for this summary. And I'm glad you alluded to things that we uh, usually don't discuss. It's not only about an endpoint of disease-free survival or GVHD, et cetera. You alluded to the fact going back to normal life, the well-being, uh, the quality of life, uh, finding a job, uh, not going to the emergency room, I know it's very hard to capture all this in a prospective trial, but thank you for sharing your experience. So, Ola, let's dig a yes. little bit deeper. Why sickle cell disease, in contrast to other malignant diseases that we know how to transplant, is tricky when it comes to choosing the conditioning regimen? Because that was actually uh, the argument behind why this abstract uh, was selected as something cutting edge, because otherwise you would say, okay, another conditioning regimen. Yes. So for starters, they do not have a leukemia that you need to eliminate, although they may have chip and stuff, but they are not patients that have leukemia. So the intense cytotoxicity to wipe out or ablate a marrow may not be necessary. Um, secondly, it is not like an autoimmune disorder, like a plastic anemia. So again, the immunosuppression does not have to be extreme, although it has to really be there because the risk of graft rejection is high. So I think this, that secondly, they, they are um, overall person 
granted that they receive hydroxyurea, they really have not received multiple lines of cytotoxic therapy. So when you factor borderline relatively healthy patient or they visit the emergency room frequently, when you look at the who they are, you really need to craft out a conditioning regimen that will be specific for that population. And that's exactly what they have done with a few iterations to get to the sweet spot that addressed all the boxes. And the patients recover relatively quickly and are with little, you know, gravis also disease. So I think they found the sweet spot that navigated all those nuances to serve the population very well. I really want to pivot to what I like most about this study, caveats, I mean, disclaimers that I'm all, I was also part of the study, that this is huge for places like sub-Saharan Africa, where this burden is really significant. And um, for them to be able to have something that might be able to be done in that environment is really huge. They worked out the protocol to the extent that it will not be that difficult to replicate in a resource sparse environment as sub-Saharan Africa. And that is really a good thing because ASH, it is true, it's American Society of Hematology, but it is really where the world goes to learn what the standard is. But, you know, at the ISCH, we promote hematology without borders, and we're very proud of our mantra. Leo? I would just like to give a little bit of editorialize about this, you know, because I'm specifically happy to hear about this, because when this haplo came for sickle cell disease 20 years ago, a lot of people, and when we started this at Hopkins, were looking to us, what are these guys doing? And I remember, and I really need to thank you also, Mohammed. you know, 10, 15 years ago, sitting on one of these, my favorite meetings in Paris, discussing about this and your colleagues from France getting excited. And we were there at 50%. So it took a long time to tune things up. And again, it was a village. It was a starting in one place and then it grew on another place. So it just showed the beauty of the science, how things slowly grow and how the things which are even in a small numbers in the US can have a broader impact. So I, I, I think this study really highlights the relevance of the science and, and the group work to address the worldwide problem. And I'll stop right there. Fantastic. So actually you started for us the conclusion, Leo, because for the last three minutes, remaining three minutes, I'd like to ask each of you actually about the thoughts and wishes, I would say, for the next five or 10 years. So, Florent, it's always the first person to start, it's the most difficult. The last person is easier. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a difficult task. And this is not for the next year, this is for the five to 10 years. So, just my first comments will be that the stem cell transplantation is not dead because with all these new cellular therapy and the, all these new targeted treatment, we can think that maybe we'll not need the stem cell transplantation anymore. And I think that for the next 10 years, this is not true. And the, the late breaking abstract we just discussed show that uh, beyond hematological malignancy, we need stem cell transplantation also for sickle cell disease. And this is very cost effective and very effective for patients when we compare to gen therapy that are uh, some very important costs. So my my, my first uh, conclusion will be that stem cell transplantation is not dead uh, because we still need it and this is still very effective. And the second comment is that we have more and more effective to prevent uh, complication of stem cell transplantation because we discuss a lot about gravidus disease prophylaxis treatment. We have a lot of new treatment of new strategy, but we did not have time to discuss also all the uh, prophylaxis to prevent infectious complications. We have now some drugs to prevent CMV, but we'll have also some new uh, CTL uh, treatment we'll be able to use to prevent or to treat all kinds of viruses. We have also some new vaccines that are going developed uh, to prevent or to treat all these diseases. So I think that we have a very promising uh, next five to 10 years for the field of stem cell transplantations. Fantastic. Samer. Thank you very much. Yes, transplantation is certainly not dead. Uh, it's all the opposite. Like I started by saying, it's really exciting time with a lot of developments. The problem, I think the field is getting sort of crowded, especially when we talk about GVHD prevention, conditioning with these monoclonal antibodies, 
And it's more important than never that we work on collaborative and thoughtful ways so we can sort out these questions and keep moving forward. Excellent. Uh, Baggy? Yes, I, I would uh, have more broad, two broader comments. And number one is access. Uh, majority of uh, patients with mal hematological malignancy and benign hematological disorders who meets the indication for cell therapy, either a CAR T or hematopoietic cell transplantations, are not able to access this. And that's true for even in the United States. Uh, so that's it's one of my number one wish that uh, we can make transplant cheaper and more accessible to more patients who are eligible for them. And the second, continuing to uh, Dr. Holmes's comment, is to Collab more collaborations among the transplant center across the globe. Uh, transplanters are a very hard-headed group of people. We have our own way of doing things. And even in Nashville, we have two transplant centers and we totally use different conditioning regimen and GVC prophylaxis. And we have our own data to show that, okay, this is what we are doing is the best way forward. But this is not how science works. Science requires prospective observational data, uh, randomized trials. Uh, and that's uh, that's very important. I wish that all of us as a, as a family can work together uh, to design novel adaptive therapies for both disease prevention, relapse prevention, and graft versus host disease prevention in the future. Thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Baggy. I would say it's United Nations against uh, uh, blood diseases. Ola? Yes, you know, <clears throat> pharmaceutical companies are heavily invested in the transplant world. But what I would really like to see will be maybe a more active role for BMT, CTN, and some of the smaller group, the magic consortiums, maybe coming together, maybe doing whatever agreements among centers that will facilitate more coordination. I think that would, that is an area that we are not as leveraged as we could be in the United States. Super. And the last word will be to our senior uh, uh, colleague, my co-chair, Professor Nagler. Also, we have Leo. You know? but I, Leo, I would... Leo already concluded, actually. Ah, he started yeah. the conclusion story. Yeah. So for me, I mean, uh, as one that was raised about immunotherapy, no chemotherapy, I think that uh, I'm fascinated and transplant, allogeneic transplantation is, Im is the immunotherapy and maybe the strongest one. So I'm uh, fascinated but, uh, by the immunotherapy aspect of the transplant and we had no time to talk about CAR T cells or cellular therapy and the monoclonal antibody. This is one. And the other time uh, things that we did not have time to address is the mutation panel and new categorization of AML and other diseases that we are able, you know, to better define the bulk of the diseases that we are treated. And I hope that this knowledge will help us, you know, to improve our results, indication and result and targeted therapy and, and uh, for the future. So one is the you know, science and the other, the, the mean to, to the immunotherapy. Well, this was really a fantastic uh, webinar. And thank you all for sharing your uh, knowledge, your time, your wisdom, your advice. Uh, I learned a lot from all of you guys. It is such a pleasure to be part of this uh, big universal family uh, fighting blood diseases, and I hope also uh, our audience enjoyed it. And uh, my last word is, wherever you are, please stay safe and keep well, and see you soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Oh